Hello and welcome to this BAFTA Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rihanna Dillon and this evening I'm going to be in conversation with two of the creative minds behind Pixar's hugely successful and incredibly affecting Soul. With me tonight, director Pete Doctor and producer Dana Murray. Welcome both of you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Or or Thank we're at, we're we're here. We say we're here. We're <laughs> still in the same place I've been for the last nine months. But you know, you're here. <laughs> the alternative, yeah. Congratulations to both of you. This is just such a gorgeous film. The reactions have been positive, just like throughout the board. Everyone is so psyched to see Soul. Pete, let's start with you. You started pitching this a few years ago, and I know that there were several incarnations of Joe before you settled on a pianist. And you talked about that being a really pure profession, which intrigued me. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, we were looking for something for Joe, like a passion that he had, something that he was he felt he was born to do that the audience could get on board with. And we tried early on. OK, I hope this is not going to offend any actors who are listening in, but he, Joe was an actor. And what we found was a lot of the audience was like, oh, I, he just wants to be famous. Right. Yeah. So they were not on board with him. And so we were looking for some occupation that was kind of pure and noble, like that you wouldn't misread. And uh, um, jazz musician was like, well, you don't get into jazz to get rich and famous, right? You do it because you love it. You have a passion for it. And we we figured that it would be really cool to watch. And I think the animators really proved us with the correct on that. Just watching John Batiste, who did the music in real life, the animators were able to capture the performance in a way that's just kind of mesmerizing. You, you just lean forward and it's like a magic trick to watch you know, a really good musician play. So that was uh, the primary reason why we made that choice early on. But then also, as we got into it, and we can talk about this in more depth later, it became such a potent metaphor for the film, jazz itself. And did you start off with the idea that this story needed to be about an African-American life, or did that suit the narrative once you'd come up with the idea? No, that came with jazz. So the decision, once we decided on a jazz musician, um, one of our consultants said, well, jazz, you could probably more accurately call it black improvisational music, because it was really, it was a, an art form developed by uh, African-Americans. And, and so we thought, well, the right thing to do is to make this character black. And Dane and I realized, well, we were going to need a lot of help because neither of us have a lot of experience in that area or, or knowledge of what it's like. And so, um, you know, Kemp Powers, uh, who's co-director, who I guess couldn't be here today. I'm sorry about that. Um, he brought a lot of detail and specificity to Joe and his community. And then we, I mean, Dana, you can jump in on all the different consultants that we had. Yeah, we started with Kemp to bring, we brought him in to write, but yeah, from, from the first day on, um, we our head of di uh, diversity and inclusion, Britta Wilson, she kind of helped us create a internal culture trust within um, some of the black employees at Pixar. They became part of the, the trust along the way. And then we um, brought on a lot of external consultants um, with all kinds of different, from, from different backgrounds and professions, um, some cultural, some music, um, Bradford Young, who's a lighting DP to help us kind of, you know, with the, the skin and the hair and all of those kinds of things. So Herbie Hancock and music yeah. and we get to go to, you know, uh, Quincy Jones, we get to visit with. So it's yeah. pretty, yeah. Uh, pretty spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible like lineup. Dana, I wanted yeah. to talk to you about, you know, you're producing your first feature film and it's soul like that's amazing it's huge and I know that it hasn't had perhaps the, re the release that you necessarily hoped it might but what have been the benefits of this going straight on to Disney plus and it getting the audience that it has so far yeah I mean I think we've all had such, well last year 2020 I think um there was we just we at, at, there was so many conversations about when our release date was going to be and it just mm -hmm. kept pushing and pushing and at, at one point Pete Kemp and I were like I like I hope someone sees this film so obviously yeah. the the huge benefit is Disney Plus is an amazing platform that reached probably way more people that would never have seen the film um so we feel incredibly lucky that we had that as an option for sure um 
yeah so what was, what was Christmas day like for you when you knew suddenly it was going out were you like incredibly nervous when you managed to switch off yeah I we talked Pete and I after we we're like did you have a relaxing break because it, it was <laughs> we tried but the whole time you are kind of on edge and just anxious and you can't stop reading um you know the reviews and of course you only see the negative ones in your own head but no it was, inc- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was incredibly exciting um to to that feeling of like because we the film had been done for like seven months at that point or something mm-hmm. so it was it was great to get it out there and the animation in the well in the great before especially is so unusual and so unique especially from what we're used to from pixar did it feel like a really brave thing to do these you know like the 2d lines for the jerry's and terry yeah, the, the yeah, irony we is we thought that would be easy. <laughs> yeah, we, we thought we were like, oh, they're just little lines, you know? So when we handed those off to our character team and then the animators, it ended up being like, it's the second most difficult Pixar character of all time, right behind Hank the octopus. So, You're kidding. Who knew? <laughs> Pete, why was sorry, that? Pete. I don't understand that. Well, it's because most um, objects are kind of like puppets, most most models. And so you say, okay, bend the wrist, forward, back, left, right. Mm-hmm. In the case of those characters, they're basically just a bunch of dots in 3D space that connect together. So to move it, you have to be able to control all these hundreds of little dots in some sort of coordinated way. And they had to develop a whole new system enabled, enabling them to do that. So. Oh my goodness. And also, you know, creating that blurred effect and the spectrum of colors that you used. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, the souls. Um, we, I think Dana and Michael Fong, who's our technical lead, came up with this idea of grouping a bunch of artists and technical folks together in a room. And luckily this was before COVID. So everybody could sit there. It was kind of a stinky, sweaty room and they would just iterate and work and show uh progress and so every week we'd come in and look at stuff and go like whoa that's can we could we use this but maybe do it you know change this make it a little more thick there or whatever and so it was very iterative it was not like usually what we're used to is you draw or paint something and you hand it to the artist and they build it in this case um it was also new that i think the only reason we able we were able to accomplish it was because of that that sort of you know shared little room community thing I, yeah, it's, it was just so beautiful and unexpected. I want to talk to you about um, the casting. So how much do the actors inform the script? Not necessarily by suggesting lines, but how much do you add to a script when you know that a specific actor will be playing that role? Well, it's an interesting process because at the beginning, you're just writing out of your head. In some cases, you are basing it on someone you know or an, an actor that's alive or dead. And then what happens usually is when we cast, what we've done uh, is ask our casting people to just bring little bits of dialogue. Don't tell us who it is. Mm -hmm. Just put it uh, on audio. Excuse me. And then we look at a picture of our character and some voices just feel like that fits. And in in fact, I think the first time we heard Jamie, I was like, whoa, that's great. Who is that? Because I didn't recognize him as Jamie Foxx. He looks like Joe. The audio, the audio looks so much like Joe, but Joe doesn't look like Jamie. So it's really interesting. <laughs> and then when we work with the actors, we rewrite everything. You know, we start to learn their cadences, the kinds of words they would use, how they talk, all those little things that end up really affecting the character quite a lot. And I know, I yeah. think, sorry, there are um, a few questions already, and there are quite a few I can't really get to everybody's names, but I know that people have mentioned Graham Norton and Richard Iowadi, which obviously, you know, for us, this is really exciting to hear these voices that we recognize. So can you talk to me about casting them, Dana? Yeah, Graham Graham Norton. um, I mean, we, I think we were both fans of the show, um, but our... Who isn't? (laughs) Yeah, he's, he's great. Um, And uh, our head of casting, Kevin Rear, he's a producer at Pixar. He's like diehard fan and he came early on when he as soon as he saw the character Moonwind he's like I have the perfect casting and we listened to the voice and we were like yeah that's 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 right that's really good so and then of course Richard Ayuada I mean so fun um Kemp I think that was his idea uh wow. to cast him but such he actually was really we never got to meet him in person unfortunately um but he he did quite a bit bit of improving like um there was a lot of like he brought 
support a lot of new lions, right, Pete? Yeah, yeah, and he he's just very. I mean, obviously, he would stick to the script, but then he would just start playing around. And I think a lot of the the stuff we ended up with in the film were, were things that he made up. You know, yeah. this yeah. won't be a disaster, that's for sure. That was all him. <laughs> Yeah. So, that's what was so great. nice kind of watching it and and listening to Richard Iwadi knowing his comedy and thinking that's definitely him that's got to be yeah. a Richard line <laughs> which is really lovely there's also that line where Joe says when he's trying to hail a cab this would be hard even if I wasn't wearing a hospital gown and it's almost throwaway but it's it's so important to acknowledge the racism that Joe has inevitably faced in a way that some children will only get when they revisit Seoul years later so who came up with that line and why was it so necessary to include it was that Kemp I think Kemp wrote it in and it, it it's interesting that line specifically became quite a big discussion point amongst amongst our cultural trust and our consultants um and I think everyone acknowledged that it, it was important to leave in um, mm -hmm. just because for two reasons, he looked crazy because he was in his hospital gown and had food all over him, but also just, yeah, the the meaning behind that. Um, so I'm glad you noticed it. Yeah, it was, it was very powerful. And also, Pete, I wanted to talk, you kind of, Dana mentioned this already, but that barbershop sequence, I think is going to be a lot of people's favourite scene, not least because it's a part of the everyday authenticity of these characters. But that scene specifically made me wonder about lighting black skin and animating Afro hair. So technically, did you have to kind of learn anything new to ensure that these characters looked the way that they did? Yeah, it was a concern from the beginning. Ian McGimmon, who's our lighting uh, director of photography, was he he didn't he wasn't worried, but he he did sort of acknowledge we haven't had a lot of experience doing this. And so Bradford Young, who's a, a brilliant brilliant DP, uh, we were able to call on him and bring him in to consult a little bit. Um, he had some really, you know, he has a very uh, a specific viewpoint on lighting, which doesn't necessarily jive with the complexity of computer, the way uh, lighting works in the computers, but he had such great insights into not only how black skin reflects and works with the lighting, but also just even culturally and, and cult, um, 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 economically what lighting means, the communication that it, that it has, you know, he, he, he was pointing out that growing up, he had a, uh, one relative who was fairly well to do and you'd walk in and it's well lit and it's a lot of light in the space and then other places where uh there's uh, poorer economics it's pretty dark and there's kind of single smaller windows and so uh even the lighting really tells you a lot about these people uh where they come from and their status you know economically which i think is is pretty i hadn't thought of any of that you know um in terms of this this film so it was it was pretty stunning and I think he had a huge effect on on the work. I've I've read some things about people thinking that this that soul might be too grown up for children but when we look back on children's films from the 80s and 90s there's an awful lot of horror like out and out horror and fear <laughs> in them so why is it so important to you that Pixar doesn't shy away from that? I mean I think those if you go all the way back to Snow White Pinocchio, this is pretty horrific stuff in those movies. Uh, and then through time, I think some of the films that have really affected us and moved us are not aiming for kids, right? They're aiming for all audiences, adults. I mean, for us, Dana and I, were we were trying to make a movie that spoke to us as people. Uh, you know, we're, um, knew, we knew we were going to be working on this movie for four or five years, and uh, we wanted there to be something that we would be able to sink our teeth into beyond just the surface level of the fun and the humor and all of that. But like, what's it about? What's it really about? And um, so we're super fortunate to work at a place that encourages that, brings it forward. And then we have this amazing platform uh, to, to bring it out into the world. I will say, uh, I don't remember ever being more nervous about a film that I've worked on than Soul, just in terms of whether it would speak to people. Um, I felt like this is probably a little bit of a smaller audience, you know, because it's talking about kind of middle of life issues mm -hmm. generally. Yes. Um, yeah. But one of the big surprises was when we screened it, a lot of young folks really resonated. And I guess in retrospect, that makes total sense because mm -hmm. that's another point in your life where you're trying to define who you are. How do I fit into the world? What am I going to do? What am I going to be? Who do I have to be? You know, all those kind of questions that 
are are really important at that point in your life. So um, it's been really gratifying to to see that it has been uh, as effective as it has for people. Um, this is, I think, probably one for Dana. This is from Payam, who wants to ask you about your sound design process. Um, so at what stage do you start talking to your sound designer and what was your approach to sound? How did you work with the sound department? I think this film, um, we wanted to bring in sound as early as possible because it really helped us define the two worlds and um, make sure there was quite a bit of contrast. Mm -hmm. I mean, New York was quite obvious. It's like you go to New York City and the sounds that you can hear there. So that was a much simpler process. But um, Ren Kleiss, who's our sound designer, he, he, I think Pete, you asked him from the very beginning. And so he would come over, um, pretty early on, like the first set of reels we were building and he would work closely with our editor, Kevin Nolteen, to really um, work on the sound design in the soul world. And so um, I believe we started talking about that quite early. Like, do we want sounds of nature and birds and water? And because we wanted it to sound calming, mm -hmm. um, but also you are kind of shocked because you've never been to this world. And you, you, as Joe shows up and he's never been there, you want him, you want to feel his anxiety, but also like we wanted it to be a serene, calming place. So, mm. yeah, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Pete. But. Well, I was going to transition into music as well, because that became so much a part of, especially uh, the ethereal world, the music that Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross mm -hmm gave us was not just like music that you play on and speakers in the front. It was like you sit in the middle of it and it became part of the sound design. Um, and he, Ren has worked with those guys on, I think all of David Fincher's films that they've worked on uh, together. And so they have this great symbiotic relationship where uh, Ren is able to use the music. And actually he, this is pretty cool. He tunes the sound effects. So if there's uh, a sound of, let's say, uh, you know, boom, some something hitting a door or whatever he'll tune it to be in in the right key to go with the music um or untune it if it's supposed to be dissonant and and wrong you know uh -huh. so it's it's uh he really thinks heavily about how the music handshakes with the sound design as does i'm sure most uh, sound designers but ren i think is really a in a class above he's he's amazing and actually, someone I think was asking about why Trent Rasner, why did you approach him to do, you know, he's not necessarily somebody that you think of for these kind of ethereal, beautiful notes. So tell me about that. I think that's why we, we approached him <laughs> because we thought, hey, let's, I mean, I love all the music that we've done in our past films, working with Randy Newman and, and Michael Giacchino has, has been amazing. But this film seemed like it really wanted it demanded something different, a different approach. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I felt like someone who does, who really thinks differently about uh, the instrumentation and the approach overall. And so, I mean, even though uh, like Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is probably the last thing you think about when you think of a Pixar film, uh, it it felt to me like, boy, those guys are just so smart. They're, they're, uh, they really push the envelope and are clever about the way they use music um, emotionally, you know, and that's exactly the kind of partnering that we're looking for. It was a stretch for us. It was a stretch for them. And I think somewhere in the middle, we came up with some new, new flavor of ice cream that, that we had never tasted before. And boy, does it taste good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a question from Darren and actually Dana I think I've heard you talk about this before so I'm, but I'm really intrigued to know did you discuss um, a possible alternative ending maybe where Joe went to the great beyond instead of returning to earth I know you mentioned there are some polarizing endings and tell me about that yeah I mean if it's okay to say Pete that was our ending for um quite a long time oh, like really? yeah and there was it was it was really interesting there was teams <laughs> within our crew of like team joe live and team <laughs> joe die and it was it was a um it was pretty polarizing as far as the way people felt about it mm -hmm. i will say everyone near the end of the film and the process of just everything we had been through as we as as we went on the journey of making this film um I think was happy with where we landed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that was that was where we were at for a really long time. And there was a lot of amazing discussions amongst our cultural trusts and our consultants about, because there's um, 
there's film tropes that uh, we didn't want to make sure we were falling into with it, you know, falling into that. So we feel yeah. like we landed on the right place for sure. I will say just to underline that it's not just like, eh, we like this better. So we went this way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's either like, what is the story need, right? So initially we thought, oh, Joe can pass on his chance to go live to 22. And that's a very sacrificial, noble thing mm -hmm. that he's over the course of the film, grown from being kind of selfish to recognizing, I had this chance, I had an amazing life, now I'm going to pass it on. Mm. As Dana said, that there are cultural things that we were totally unaware of that you go, oh, yeah, I, given the history mm -hmm. of storytelling and and uh, kind of holding down of, of people, uh, African Americans, and putting them in certain boxes, you, you totally get why that would be seen through a completely different lens. Yeah. Um, and then as the story developed, we re recognized too that Joe was coming through, through these spaces and not going like, oh yeah, I had a great time. It was more like, whoa, I missed the chance to really get to know Des the barber. Mm -hmm. I had missed the chance to really connect on a deeper level with my mom. It felt f unfair to just send him on having not, you know, not giving him a chance to go back and do it the right way. Yeah. yeah. Um. There's a question from Haley here who says, you've managed to successfully explore and explain how someone's emotions can work in Inside Out. And now you depict a very poignant and interesting look at the afterlife and the great before. Is, are there any other existential elements of life that you would like to explore in animation in the future? Yeah, there's lots of stuff. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the cool thing is, I think animation has the opportunity, as does any filmmaking, I guess, but I, I feel it, especially in animation, to talk about stuff that's very personal and deep. And uh, um, and I think right now we have all these amazing new filmmakers who come from very different um, backgrounds. Um, Turning Red, the film that's, I guess, the second one out from now is uh, Domi Shi, who's a, a Chinese-Canadian. So she's coming at it, growing up at one point, uh, on the one hand, is very familiar, the difficulty of what being in junior high and all that. Mm -hmm. But from her point of view, very different, very specific to the culture that she grew up in. So I, I feel like animation has this opportunity of really representing almost anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's exciting to look ahead and see what we've got on the horizon. It's going to be, I, have, I think you're going to, uh, I hope you like it. <laughs> well, actually, you know, when people hear the word Pixar, they often think, oh, this sounds so... I'm not trying to be, you know, brown nosing, but, you know, they think of excellence, of entertainment. There's a trust in this studio that perhaps more than most others, actually. What is that like for you on the inside? Do you feel that weight and responsibility, Dana? Well, sure. I mean, I think that um, as storytellers and filmmakers, we have a responsibility to our audience. Um, and you never want to put something out there that you're not proud of or mm -hmm. that you're um so I think I think we do put pressure on ourselves I don't but I yeah I guess I'll leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> um and this is just a cheeky little question Pete who gets to decide on the easter eggs and where they go like the Pizza <laughs> Planet truck and John Ratzenberger and all those little moments that fans look out for endlessly well, there are some things that we, Dana and I put in, but most of it, most of it, I think, is the art department and specifically, like, is it the graphics department? I mean, yeah, the, Dana, yeah. you, you, who, who runs it? <laughs> um, honestly, on this, every film tracks it a little bit differently, but mm -hmm. we want to make sure we had to move so fast uh, that our schedule was shorter with this film. And so we felt like at the end, um, our, our, I had our art coordinator just kind of like make sure we weren't missing anything. And then we would talk about where stuff could go. But um, yeah, mostly the art department is putting in really fun graphics for mm -hmm. the most part. I remember, Danny, you were talking about it and we were like, I'm so sick of talking to all the inside jokes. We have to work on the story. Let's just put all the inside jokes in one shot. So there's yeah. the shot when they walk, they go into the hall of everything. Uh -huh. Almost everything is there, but of course we couldn't help ourselves and they put in inside jokes all over the place everywhere else too, so, yeah. Um, I can't see the question now. Someone actually asked about the that, that sort of hall and how you um, sort of found inspiration for creating that beautiful imagery that's kind of so mm. 
obvious when you watch it, you know exactly what it is, but it's brand new as well. That it was that was really cool. And you know, as soon as we thought, okay, the great before gives us our personality attributes and maybe it also seeds interests that we will find uh fascinating throughout our lives so maybe there's like this grand hall at, at one point we talked about it being more like a museum and we had a branching structure so that you'd come in and you'd choose like arts sciences and then you'd go further and you'd so it was very logical but then we were like well no that doesn't seem like that's the way people turn out. It seems much more random. So let's just throw it all in this massive building that's so huge you can't even see any walls. Um, and so Steve Pilcher, who's our, sound, our uh, production designer, I think did the majority of that exploration, if I'm remembering right. Um, anyway, yeah. we had an amazing art department. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, like, they were able to pull um, models in from so many of our past films. So mm -hmm. if you pause on in there, you can really kind of see things from, like, even back to Wally. -E, you'll see oh, stuff. Amazing. So, yeah. You'll Didn't they say there's something there from every, every single film in that shot? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So everybody after this Q&A is going straight on to rewatch that, <laughs> right? And pausing on that scene. There yeah, you we're, go. we're doing that en masse. Um, Anna has asked, what key principles would you recommend to directors and writers who want to write and tell stories about more diverse characters without the lived experience of a different ethnicity or culture? And what sort of feedback and guidance were you getting from your internal cultural trust team to ensure that the African-American experience was portrayed authentically? That's a great question. Yeah. Those are big, big things. And I think uh, Dana was, you know, I was a little grouchy about it at the beginning because I'm like, can't we, we will deal with that later. We have to tell the story. We have to get the story right. And I think Dana rightly recognized, well, it's so much a handshake between the two. Mm. You know, you can't tell the story right unless you know the culture. So there were a lot, I guess the advice I'd have is like, get ready for a lot of advice. Um, and it's necessary, but it acts, it, it, you don't necessarily as as somebody who's like okay that didn't work uh, i'm going to go back and do it again you're not necessarily looking for to pile on more notes at these moments but they're all very necessary because you are not going to get better unless you really listen if you have an open mind and uh really bring it into the the process mm -hmm. um yeah. dana you have any thoughts i i i would add that um you know say our, our culture trust was about 12 people, you're going to get 12 different opinions and thoughts. And so I think um, one of the hardest parts of the process is really listening to each um, point of view and then doing what's right for the story, you know? And so, and like Pete said, it's like each, each person's point of view and story is, is infused in the storytelling and the sets and everything you see you know, in Joe's apartment or in the barbershop. It's like, those were all like, if you just really look at those sets, it's like Des has a whole background and story told there that we spent like days and hours and hours on, you know? So it just all shows up on screen. Mm -hmm. And even with all those consultants, there are some people who think we got it wrong. You know, mm -hmm. you just, mm -hmm. you, you, and, and I think as Dana said, everybody's experience is different. Um, everybody's experience feels true to them. So, you know, they have all the right to argue with uh, the choices we made, but we yeah. did we did what we thought was best for the film. And I suppose to that end, what do you what do you love more in your roles? Do you love delving into the real world and exploring cultures and traditions through a Pixar lens or inventing your own world? Because we see both in Seoul and they're both done beautifully. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, I love the soul world and it's so fun because we, we all have kids and it's fun to just talk about their personalities and like where, why does my daughter love climbing up a wall that I'm so scared of heights, mm -hmm. things like that. But I think on this film, it was one of the most gratifying experiences to go mm -hmm. along this journey. And I learned so much about the African-American culture. We, we, we all took a trip to DC to go the, to the... African American History Museum, the Smithsonian, and we took our crew there. And it's just that it was so gratifying. So I'd say for this film, probably the real world. Yeah, for me, I think it's the fantasy, but our own lives reflected in it. You know, something like emotions, okay, 
nobody's ever seen emotions we don't know what it looks like but we recognize ourselves in that or or even like monsters it kind of reflects back on our own experiences um but from a totally different viewpoint so that's that's what i love about uh exploring these worlds i'm gonna merge james and callum's questions um so james saying it's a beautiful film in so many ways are we ever going to find out what newborn life 22 was going to be born into <laughs> or were we ever going to find that out and have you held anything back for a potential sequel which callum also wants to know hmm we did talk about seeing where 22 ended up. You know, it's one of those things where as soon as you answer it, you kind of close the door for some people's imagination. And it's maybe not as unique and special and intriguing once you answer it. So I actually kind of like it when people say, oh, I wish you'd show. Ble that means, hey, we left them wanting more, which is the old showbiz <laughs> adage, you know. Pete, remember at our... Um at our audience preview, uh, we were doing a note session at the end with the audience that had just watched it. And one woman was like, I'm so glad that Joe went back to be a teacher. And we were like, we just <laughs> thought it was so great because in her mind, uh, yeah. that's what he was going back to do, you know, but we didn't answer. But that, then so. someone else in the audience said, no, no, he's a yeah. musician. Like yeah. that was, that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, we were like, good. <laughs> Um, oh gosh, there are so many questions coming in. Um, this person hasn't left their name, but they want to know, Dana, how does the pairing up process between producer and director work at Pixar? And at what stage of the idea or story did you start working together with Pete? I think the process has evolved a bit because I, I just got paired with someone else. Um, but with Pete, it, I, I was in development. Um, I was kind of helping run development at that time. And so I got to be in there really early on in the process. Jonas Rivera, who um, did Up and also Inside Out with Pete, was, was going to produce the film. He got pulled on to Toy Story 4 mm -hmm. and is now um, an executive at the company. So I think I got really lucky because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> because Jonah's got a different job so yeah I was gonna be I was gonna be on the film in some respects um but uh, yeah I it was I got um tapped on the head for that one <laughs> very very lucky um I am obsessed with Terry I know we, we've kind of talked about the Jerry's but Terry that character is absolutely hilarious why did you want there to be no real baddie but just more someone that you would avoid at a work Christmas party <laughs> Well, it seemed like, okay, who would care? Uh, you know, as we actually early on, we didn't have that character. And then um, as it felt like Joe was free to just kind of loiter around on earth as long as he wanted, we thought, well, there's somebody maybe following him. Who would that be? So we came up with this sort of accountant character and we thought there was great humor in how extremely serious she takes it. Um, whereas it's really only a little bean, you know, moving across an abacus. And uh, Rachel House, of course, she's another one we never got to meet because she lives in New Zealand. Man, what a great actress and, and, and uh, you know, added so much to the part. Um, and I hopefully we'll get to meet her someday. Um, but it was really her uh, work in um, Taika Waititi's film, uh, Hunt for the Wilder People, that we're like, oh, OK, I can see how this could work. Um, so... <laughs> That was inspired casting. Um, <laughs> this is also from somebody who hasn't left their name, but I think maybe one for some of the kids who are watching. What is a normal day like working at Pixar? <laughs> like, you know, you have so many people's dream job. Tell us what the reality <clears throat> is. Well, the reality right now is we're at our homes and we miss going to it work. It looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a really great place to work. I mean, I feel like I've been there almost 20 years and um, I feel like you get to work with your friends and almost become kind of like your family. Mm -hmm. um, you work really hard, but it, the kind of, the cool thing that being on a film is you go through these um, hard years of like working really hard and then you're done and you can take a little break and it's just like this. Well, now not with your job, Pete, you're always busy, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be, you know, on a break. Right. Uh, Pete, because you're the starting a new role, right? You're you're starting a new, or you have started a new role. What are you going to miss about, you know, like the sort of day-to-day -day directing? What are you hoping that you're going to get out of your new role as well? 
Well, the new role is, is quite different than directing. So directing obviously is helping to create this world and make decisions and, you know, direct people to, uh, to come up with all the brilliant work, which by the way, if you're a kid and you love drawing, uh, I think do it, draw a lot, keep a sketchbook. Um, I love drawing too. Unfortunately, as a director, or producer, you probably don't get to draw so much. Um, so if that's what you love, then you know animation, design, those are the things you'll want to be focused on. As a director and a producer, I find it early on I was exhausted because all day people are watching. You walk into a room and they're looking to you to answer questions very quickly. They've done four or five weeks worth of work. And you come in and in three minutes, you're supposed to look and go yes or no, left or right, blue or red, whatever. So it's, there's a lot of, uh, like the tensions are high through a lot of the day. There's a lot of um, intensity. Um, this new role is not that. This new role is now I'm watching the director. I don't want to get in their business. I want them to make their movie. How do I help them? How can I advise them, help set up the situation, or even just ask questions that guides them to their own best decision? Because I don't want to be making their movies i want them to make their movies yeah oh we've got a question who someone wants to know what would you say to the aspiring writers who want to work mm -hmm. on improving their world building and storytelling yeah that's a good question i guess actually i was looking back dana i was we're gonna i'm gonna give some sort of talk later about uh about the making of this film and how much of the first year was just about world building mm -hmm. like we had the first story that soul was it was two souls who had never gone to earth one named 17 and the other one named 22 the entire film took place up in the great before i think we called it soul land at the time and uh so it was very different and a lot of it was just about philosophy of like are we given some sense of purpose do those characters have that or how does that work out and 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 what are they is there like a goal for them like how do they know if they've succeeded in life and when are they ready and a lot of these things so it was just trying out a lot of different things i think um the thing that i've learned about world building is that it's so key to the storytelling mm -hmm. um you know, uh, characters like joy and sadness, you know, we needed to design a world that that um, supported their story, which was, hey, they're kicked out of headquarters. Now they have to struggle to get back there and it's going to be a journey. So we designed that whole structure in in the in the mind what to reflect that. Similarly, I mean, we can go on and on about that, but it's it's a it's a big um, I think the number one advice, I guess, is be very thoughtful and be very flexible because <laughs> you'll end up changing things quite a lot. Yeah. Dana. I think I'd add, you, you, we did so much research in those first couple of years too, um, which spark, it always, if you ever get in a rut, right. it can spark something fresh Absolutely. or take you down a new path. And um, so I feel yeah. like the first couple of years of development, just talk to as many people as you can in whatever yeah. you're developing. And what have you learned on Soul that you really want to take forward to your next projects that perhaps you hadn't necessarily considered before, Dana? Hmm. I mean, I think each each film I'm on, I learned so much. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like this partnership with Pete has obviously, like you know, he 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 has so much experience. And so I think like, um, I'm going, my next project, I'm working with a new director. So I think I can, um, I think I'll be really helpful uh, for her to just like, because I'm coming from a, a play, I, this is my third film with Pete. So I mm -hmm. just working with someone who's so, so experienced, I'm hoping I can help her with that. Mm -hmm. And you were just talking about, you know, you have, you had this idea before and obviously a lot of that ended up on the cutting room floor. So Dana, how much of your kind of job is it to say, actually, this isn't working or we need to, we need to get rid of that. If, if somebody say like Pete, who's come up with it is, is perhaps still holding on to that initial idea. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm not like in the edit, Pete spends like most his days in editorial. That's kind of where he makes his films for the mm -hmm. most part. 
um, the, the writers will be in there. He'll be in there. Sometimes the animators are in there. Um, I'm kind of coming in throughout the day and I'll watch a scene that they've worked on. Um, I'm not really saying like cut that. I think we're all just discussing it. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously in the back of my mind, I'm like, no, this scene needs to get to animation like yesterday. So I'm trying to guide <laughs> the conversation into like, how can we get it there? Like, but story is always going to be the most important thing. So if it's not ready, I'm going to go back and figure out another scene we can get, you know? So mm-hmm. it's just the, it's keeping everyone fed, but also mm-hmm. making sure that you're nurturing the story and doing the best thing for the story every day. Yeah. It's interesting because the director is usually, at least at Pixar, the one that's coming up with like what goes on the screen, but the producer in a way is over the director saying, we need more humor. We need more focus on the cultural authenticity. We need, and so Dana is making these choices of like, who's in the room? What meetings should we be focusing more on? And what can we do without? And so, you know, in a very big kind of macro way, she's completely steering the way the project's going. Um, it's, it's a real partnership, right? Because um, if Dana were there saying, I think we should do this or that, um, I mean, that's, that's cool, but I start to worry like, well, then who's driving the ship in terms of production, you know? So I think we both have to have an enormous amount of trust for each other, the director and the producer, that the right choices will end up being made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I thought, sorry. Um, so this is a question from Darren who wants to know, Pete, you've worked on a huge number of Pixar films prior to and including Soul. How has your experience working with Pixar developed through the years and how similar or different was the process of making Soul from previous films? This film was um, quicker than the last ones I've done. We last a year. Um, and so it was four years instead of five, which still sounds like probably a long time to most people. Um, how come? Where, and did I, that, where did that year go? Why did you need to leave? How did you leave I don't that? know. Where did it go? <laughs> uh, but we, we happened to like be at a place where our story was kind of, well, the studio thought our story was moving pretty quickly. And mm-hmm. it just was the best thing for the studio to give the film ahead of us a little bit more time. They just, they were, they were making some big story changes. So it was kind of like, and I think just because of Pete's experience, they're like, he can do it. So <laughs> that's why we lost a year. <laughs> but it was, I mean, I think the trickiest part for me, there was a point at which, because Joe is African-American, that I, I at, early on, I was just writing the way I thought I would talk. I was writing Joe for me. And then at some point, the more cultural, it was a lot of the cultural trust voices started resonating in my head. And I'm like, I don't think I can write for Joe. And that was a scary point for me because I think everybody has to find a way into the character, right? The lighting people, the animators, everybody has to feel like they are uh, an equal contributor to this, to bring this character to life. And so really between uh, talking with Jamie Foxx and uh, Kemp a lot about that, I started to shake that off and feel like, all right, if I do anything that's, that's inauthentic, or wrong, those guys will be there to catch me, right? My job is just to try to make sure that this character is as unique, specific, and is really working to tell the story. Um, so that was that was probably one of the newer things for me, because um, I, you know, that was not an issue for like the last. Well, not a hundred percent. I think now that I say that, Inside Out, we talked a lot uh, on the film about. Hey, wait a minute. This guy is writing for a you know a twelve year old girl. How does he know what that life is like? And so we did. We talked to a lot of the women on the crew. We talked to real kids, but you know ultimately even there I was able to tap into my own sense of what that was like growing up and yeah. my memories of feeling out of my league and you know overwhelmed and socially all this stuff is new. So yeah, um, yeah. Hey, by the way, I, I want to go back to the, I don't want to imply in the last question that the producer is not creative and le- creatively involved. Dana certainly was and had really great uh, insights into decisions that we should make. I guess what I was just trying to get to was that everybody, it's not like everybody on the film is an equal partner. Everybody has their own area 
uh, and well, equal partner, yes, but they're not uh, trying to do everything. Everybody has to know kind of what their job is. Otherwise, the movie just doesn't get made. Yeah. If the lighting guy's trying to come in and make notes about animation, they're welcome, but the prime <laughs> focus has to be on lighting. You know what I mean? Um, I am really sorry, but I've just realized the time. We're going to have to leave oh. it there. We've had so oh. many questions come through. Thank you so, so much for all of your contributions. And a massive thank you to Pete and Dana for joining us tonight. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I know that the audience have absolutely loved it as well. Thank you so much. Congratulations you, on Soul. And cool. Soul is, is, of course, still out to watch on Disney+. Plus. So I'm sure everyone is going to be going back and freezing it at certain points so they get <laughs> look more for all the inside jokes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so yes, thank you very, very much. Congratulations. Have a lovely day, evening for us, day for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>